I have with me today uh, two uh, outstanding colleagues of mine, Rosemary Masters and Shelley Rosen, and they are part of the team that has been working on this project for several years now, and they're going to uh, introduce themselves. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rosemary Masters. I'm a clinical social worker practicing in New York City. I'm the co-director of the Trauma Studies Center, a division of the Institute for uh, Contemporary Psychotherapy's Trauma Studies Center. And I'm Shelley Rosen, a clinical social worker in private practice in New York City, specializing in trauma treatment. I'm also on faculty at ICP's Trauma Studies Center, and I'm a member of this psychological trauma consulting team on this project. And I'm Christine Alvarez, Director of Pre-Hospital Care Programs at LaGuardia, where I've been working for the past uh, 30 years. And our team is going to be presenting this webinar and hoping to answer for you these questions, why a curriculum is needed for the prevention of psychological trauma, in the EMS field, how the curriculum was developed, and what process was used to bring it into the classroom. We're going to begin with an overview of psychological trauma. We're going to describe the collaboration that produced this curriculum and key elements of the curriculum itself. Lastly, we will discuss our experience of introducing this new material into our EMS program. I'm now going to turn it over to Shelley Rosen to, to give you the beginning of the overview of psychological trauma. So we all know that terrible things happen to people all the time. War, crime, disasters, intimate violence, medical emergencies. Survivors can suffer enduring emotional problems, also called psychological trauma. Some of the symptoms of psychological trauma include flashbacks, nightmares, feelings of helplessness, feeling overwhelmed, and the inability to feel hope. Extreme trauma impacts our nervous system. And then, a person's nervous system can get stuck in high gear, which we know as something like anxiety, or their system collapses into what we know as depression. A healthy nervous system gears up for challenges and calms down for recovery. This flexible nervous system is one way to describe psychological resilience. So looking at this PowerPoint slide, you can see two horizontal lines and a flowing line in the middle. That flowing line represents a flexible nervous system. Let me just give you an example, a very common example. Think about being on your way to work in your car, and you're moving along in a relaxed state, and then you hit traffic. You begin to worry that you'll be late for work, and your nervous system starts getting geared up. So you may feel alert, perhaps what we call anxious. Um, and on this chart, this, this is the line that's sloping up towards the uh, sympathetic. You then begin to plan, perhaps to think about your schedule, and you're using this energy um, to think and plan and figure out what to do. And then as you realize you kind of um, are thinking about your day, you begin to calm down because your day looks manageable even if you're going to be a bit late. So your nervous system then slopes down and begins to settle. But then the traffic might stop, let's say, altogether, and you're not moving. And now it's really getting late. And your nervous system starts gear getting geared up again. None of us likes to be stuck in traffic. You might feel your heart racing. Then the line, notice the line in the chart sloping upwards again. Then maybe you're beginning to think about the nice time you had last night with an old friend or a party you went to recently, which might bring a smile to your face and might bring your nervous system down again to the relaxed state. This is a flexible, resilient nervous system. But sometimes, if the stress is overwhelming and shocking, as in an assault or a medical emergency or a disaster, your nervous system can get stuck on on. And this can look like anxiety or panic. So if you're looking at the chart, see, you can see the gray, flexible nervous system um, line that we were looking at before. But look at the red line. 
which shows that if there's a traumatic event, your nervous system can get stuck on on or stuck on off. So the person with, um, we don't know exactly why the mind and body get stuck this way. It might be a glitch in the way our nervous systems have evolved, or it may be something adaptive um, to human groups who faced ongoing danger. It's as if this overwhelming trauma has led the mind and body to say something like, whoa, big bad things are happening and can happen again, so I better stay keyed up and ready and prepared. But we're actually not sure why this happens. So the person with PTSD or other trauma reactions can have this stuck on on, see on the very top of the page, nervous system, always anxious, always keyed up. And notice the upper right-hand corner of the slide describing the symptoms of a hyper-aroused nervous system. That person's, uh, for those of you who are EMTs, paramedics, that person's nervous system is on uh, sympathetic arousal most of the time. So they feel overwhelmed by their arousal, and they are what we say is outside that zone of resilience. Looking up there on the far right at the top, you see anxiety, panic, hyperactivity, exaggerated startle response inability to relax, restlessness, hypervigilance, digestive problems, emotional flooding, chronic pain, sleeplessness, and uh, quick to anger or hostility or rage. Or overwhelming and shocking experiences can cause a person's nervous system to be stuck on off. This can look like depression or exhaustion. Again, looking at the chart on the lower left, see depression, flat affect, lethargy, deadness, exhaustion, chronic fatigue, disorientation, disconnection, dissociation, complex syndrome, those would be uh, medical syndromes, pain, low blood pressure, and poor digestion. Sometimes, um, person who's traumatized can fluctuate between the two extremes. So sometimes they might be in really high gear, quick to anger or anxiety or startle, and sometimes they may experience themselves as just exhausted and depressed. People who've been traumatized can also have intrusive memories. Um, uh, and rather than remember the story calmly, uh, out of nowhere, a piece of the story may come to mind, and we call those flashbacks. Um, people who are traumatized can also have distortions of meaning. A person with trauma systems, symptoms may think and feel negative beliefs about themselves. They may think and feel it was my fault, or I am a bad person, or I will never be safe, or all of those and more. Survivors of Extreme events have a wide range of reactions. Much depends upon the person's prior psychological, social, and physiological history, as well as the severity of the event. Some people can come at ev events with little or no symptoms, and others may have severe PTSD. Others may have some level of symptoms. Each person has a unique reaction. But we do know from uh, multiple studies that somewhere between 15 to 25 percent of survivors will suffer long-term psychological symptoms. One critical factor that can influence whether a survivor becomes symptomatic is the social support they receive at the time of the traumatic accident. EMTs and paramedics are in an extraordinarily important position to prevent or minimize psychological trauma in the patients they treat. The LaGuardia Project improves the training of EMTs and paramedics to increase the likelihood that their actions can prevent psychological trauma in their patients. It prepares these trainees to respond to patients' care and helplessness while they are attending to the patient's physical needs. We will tell you about this curriculum that fosters psychological competence and intervention, how it was taught to LaGuardia EMS students, and how they responded to the new curriculum. The collaborators 
where the Institute for Contemporary Psychotherapy Trauma Studies Center and the LaGuardia Community College Pre-Hospital Care Program. We want to give you a sense of the spirit and character of these two institutions. Working together, we were able to foster a unique climate of dialogue and creative energy. Now Rosemary Masters is going to tell you a little bit more about these two institutions. The Institute for Contemporary Psychotherapy offers mental health professionals training to improve and expand their clinical skills. The Institute has a fourfold mission, identify the mental health needs of underserved populations, develop strategies to treat those needs, to train psychotherapists to use those strategies, and to provide low-cost psychotherapy to patients needing innovative treatment modalities. To give you a sense of our history of innovation, here are a few of the programs we've uh, sponsored. One is a psychoanalytic and psychodynamic training program, which opened the doors for psychoanalytic training to social workers and other mental health professionals, and in turn offers low-cost therapy to individuals who could not otherwise afford it. Another one of our programs the Center for the Study of Anorexia and Bulimia was the first non-hospital-based program in the U.S. to offer training in the treatment of eating disorders. Our Psychotherapy Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality provides affirmative psychotherapy to, to the LGBT community and recognizes the range of gender identity and sexuality in all of us. And then our program, the Trauma Study Center, was founded after 9-11. We offer an intensive two-year program which teaches the theory and treatment of psychological trauma to mental health professionals. We bring experts on trauma to New York City to present new approaches to trauma. We also recognize the lack of trauma awareness in the New York metropolitan area. So we offer seminars on psychological trauma to a wide range of human services agencies, hospitals, schools, colleges, foster care, and domestic violence programs. And it was this community education project that brought us into collaboration with the LaGuardia Community College. As you can see, it was very important for the institute uh, to be part of this uh, collaboration. Now, a little bit about LaGuardia Community College. Uh, here's a picture of us in the Borough of Queens, where many students struggle with significant learning deficits due to poverty, lack of facility in English, and poor educational opportunities. So with that challenge of, of the diversity of our, of our students, and with the large population that we have of 18,000 credit-seeking students and 40,000 continuing education students, uh, we are designated a Hispanic-serving serv institution by the federal government with students from 160 different countries speaking more than 120 different primary languages, and many of our students are first generation. The college has received many awards, including the Bellwether Award for Exemplary Instructional Programs, the Community College Excellence Award from the MetLife Foundation, the Example of Best Practice from the Learning Outcomes, National Institute for Learning Outcomes Assessment, and we received recently a First in the World grant from the U.S. Department of Education in competition with 500 other schools in the United States. So with the support of an institution of this type, the Hospital Care Program has been in existence now for 30 years in EMT training, 20 years in paramedic training. We have attempted to set the standard for excellence with high pass rates on our New York State certification exams, high postgraduate employment rates, and by offering a degree program which is unique in that it is a 
combination degree program and certificate program and open to both degree and non-degree students and with outstanding faculty labs and student support. We have received numerous um, accolades for the innovative pedagogy for our EMT Supporting Adults Through Vocational EMT Training Program, also known as SAVE, a collaborative effort with our PCAP, Pre-College Academic Program uh, Department, where basic skills is provided in combination with our technical EMT training. And these are the awards that we have received from the Continuing Education Association of New York, the National Council of Workforce Education, and the National Council of Continuing Education and Training. Now, Rosemary uh, Masters, who is uh, director of the Trauma Studies Center, met with Gail Mello, president of the college, and explained to her the importance of providing human services workers of all professions with an understanding of the causes, causes and symptoms of psychological trauma. And she will now uh, speak a little bit more to this. Yeah, this collaboration happened over uh, actually almost five years. It began when uh, President Mello arranged for me to meet with department heads of LaGuardia. Uh, and with those departments were students who were most likely to encounter psychologically traumatized people. Christine, who you've already heard from today, as director of the pre-hospital care program, spoke of the fact that EMT and paramedic programs such as LaGuardia's do an excellent job in teaching medical skills, but woefully underprepare their students to deal with the terror, humili humiliation, and rage that often uh, accompanies um, the experience of a medical or other kind of emergency. The experience and knowledge of the trauma studies expert was needed to help develop the program. And what we wanted to do was equip EMTs and paramedics to respond to patients in ways that would minimize patient distress and foster patient resiliency. And in addition, foster the resiliency of EMTs and paramedics themselves as they gain confidence and self-esteem in acquiring such skills. Senior college administration selected the pre-hospital care program to partner with ICP trauma consultants. Our job was to identify, codify, and effectively teach the skills necessary to prevent psychological trauma. We stress from the beginning and throughout the project, we've had the strong support of senior college administration. Ms. Alvarez formed a committee of four senior EMS faculty of the pre-hospital care program to work with, with our team of ICP Trauma Study Center consultants. The faculty team is composed of Ms. Alvarez, David Brenner, William Schaub, and Megan Williams, all very experienced uh, paramedic uh, faculty. And the trauma consultants included myself, Rosemary Masters, Shelley Rosen, Carl Auerbach, and Judith Friedman, Susie Zinn, and Huang Fan, who were also uh, previous contributors to the program. For the past five years, the joint ICP LaGuardia Committee has worked tirelessly to design and implement the new curriculum. The process of curriculum received a tremendous boost when LaGuardia became the recipient of a Department of Labor grant to foster psychological resiliency. So why was there a need to change the curriculum? Well, currently EMT and para paramedic curriculums teach very little about how to handle patients' psychological distress and do so usually in the communications lecture. In the communications lecture, what usually is focused upon is the how to obtain a patient's mental status, how to ask open rather than closed questions, how to communicate with different populations such as 
uh, how to communicate with geriatric populations, pediatric populations, people with different cultural differences. It really does not address people having uh, psychological trauma when they are in an emergency situation. And it gives no opportunity for students to practice any skills in communicating with patients. There's no way for the students to learn how to be effective in communicating with patients in the field or how to diminish their psychological trauma. So how could we foster psychological competency skills so that students could confidently employ them in the field? This was our task, to identify in clear, precise terms skills that the trainees needed to learn, how they should learn them, and how to prepare the faculty to teach those skills effectively. So we decided to use the pedagogical perspective of Paolo Freire, a philosopher and educator from Brazil, um, who uh, felt that the best way to uh, is to create a dialogue that education should be shared among equals. And that way, everyone is an owner of the education. So we took our experts in psychological trauma, our faculty committee, and our teachers, and we engaged in that dialogue to create the curriculum together, one that was useful, one that was practical, one that could be implemented in the classroom and be translated effectively into field use. Contributions to the process were also made by students and by former patients who had been recipients of EMS care. The faculty had a twofold contribution because the faculty are also field providers. So they have their experience in the field with their patients and the experience in the classroom with the students. And the ICP experts presented their knowledge of psychological trauma. Together, the collaboration and honest dialogue brought about an understanding of how to integrate this knowledge into the fabric of the curriculum, and even more importantly, bring excitement for the implementation of this new EMS model of education a sense of ownership of the knowledge, and a desire to use the tr teaching strategies to bring about real genuine change. This curriculum substantively changes the way EMS responders work, as we no longer focus on the physical illnesses and injuries alone, but expand to include the invisible psychological wounds. To make this transformative change requires that faculty see and understand the need to make the change, believe in the methodology of the curriculum and the outcomes it can bring, and can execute it. The committee discussed at length situations in which they had seen patients treated with and without sensitivity to their psychological distress. So here, this is Rosemary again speaking. That uh, there is, of course, a huge range of situations that can lead to enduring psych psychological problems. Obviously, um, witnessing a death, serious physical traumatic injuries, an assault, sexual assault or abuse, child abuse and neglect, domestic violence, elder abuse and neglect, injury to a child, serious illness, extreme pain, loss of abilities sudden changes of living situations, mental illness, poverty, multiple complex issues with minimal support, family members is lost or injured. It's a huge list. And the committee realized almost any situation can trigger a traumatic response in a patient. In the case of psychological trauma, actions and statements by emergency workers should address the sense of terror, helplessness, confusion, and isolation experienced by patients in a medical crisis together with their families. So all of the struggles 
with what to say in these situations as, as we're not prepared or trained to deal with the emotional side of these patient care issues. So contributions to figuring out what we needed to do were also made by, by uh, students in, in the LaGuardia program and by former patients who've been recipients of EMS care. Our interviews with former patients were especially instructive. I just want to run through with you some of the things helpful and unhelpful uh, patients experienced. So here's an example. Uh, this was a, uh, a patient who said, my partner was driving, the car hit black ice and skidded. My partner was severely injured. Her foot was almost severed from her leg. I had bad abrasions on my leg. The EMT arrived with an atmosphere of camaraderie. They were joking with each other back and forth. They took no interest in me. One of them was on a cell phone talking to a friend. I felt dismissed. I disappeared. My partner was taken to another hospital. I didn't see her for four days. So here's another example. In the ambulance, the EMTs talked about their personal lives in front of me. I would have liked to be distracted and comforted. I felt sad and angry and felt the EMTs couldn't wait to drop me off and get drugs. And still another, I was not allowed to take a coat or bring any personal belongings to the hospital, get my medication, or, or leave food and water for my cat. I felt ignored, placated, roughed up, and completely dehumanized by the experience. I was psychologically harmed, and I still feel traumatized. I would have liked to have been told what was happening. I felt alone. There was a lot of chaos. I understand, this patient said, that if people are at death's door, they have a job to do. In the ambulance, when things were now less urgent, I would have liked them to, to give me some information, be reassuring, a little bedside stuff. But I'm glad to say not all the patients had such um, unfortunate stories. So let me give you some skilled EMT responses. This was a woman who was literally run over by a truck. I was lying on the street in terrible pain. The EMS team told me they were going to lift me onto the stretcher and that it would hurt. But they said they would stabilize me with straps on the stretcher and I would feel better. On the way to the hospital, they kept telling me how many minutes before we got to Bellevue. We'll be there in 10 minutes. We'll be there in five. Once we're there, you'll be given something for the pain. And then she added, it really helped to know what was happening. And here's another from a family member. The EMTs talked directly to my father. They said, we're here now, and you will be OK. Before they even started to ask questions, it gave my dad and my sister and I a huge sense of relief and made my dad feel calm. After putting oxygen on my father and checking him out, they told us that my dad was going to be just fine, which was very reassuring and decreased our anxiety. The EMTs transported my dad to the hospital we requested. His doctor was waiting for him when we got to Cornell West, uh, New York Cornell Hospital. And here's another family example. My husband had been ill for quite some time. He needed to go to the hospital. We called for an ambulance. My husband was fully alert and in a lot of pain. The paramedics, tr paramedics tried to make him as comfortable as possible. They were very kind to me. They let me sit by my husband's side. They answered questions directly about how long it would take to get to the hospital. They kept me updated about how far away they were, we were from the hospital. They were very kind and skilled. So in order to develop the curriculum, we conducted three all-day workshops with the faculty, which included the neurobiology of the psychological trauma, which was presented by our experts from the ICP, 
And we invited faculty to comment on patient responder interactions that they had witnessed. We encouraged the faculty to reflect on the, I say sometimes, but maybe frequent stressors that they personally experienced in the course of their work. And we invited their suggestions on how to best address patient psychological needs. The workshops were crucial to the development of the new curriculum. Faculty participation and input made the curriculum as much their creation as that of the experts and program administration. When conducting workshops of this type, discussions of psychological trauma may result in some participants requiring emotional support. This should be made available. Participants should be so advised at the beginning of the workshop. So should you be conducting workshops of this type, this is what we recommend that you also do. The faculty on, in EMS uh, who are paramedics and EMTs in the field may wish to share things, and these things can be very uh, emotionally upsetting at times. And these were some of the things that we learned in the workshop. Psychological competency skills must be woven into each and every stage of training. And the trainees need to be required to practice the psychological skills as they perform medical treatment of simulated patients. Skills need to be included and recorded on the skill sheets employed at each stage of the training. The students should be regularly evaluated, not just on their medical skills, but psychological ones as well. Students should be encouraged to feel pride in performance of their psychological skills. So as we conduct our psychomotor skills training in the class, the psychological skills are integrated into the psychomotor skills performance, and they're considered to be equally as important as the steps that are involved in performance of the psychomotor skills. And the students are evaluated on those. The next step that we had, and this is Shelley Rosen speaking again, was that as a group we were deciding in the team what were the skills that needed to be performed how, were they, how do they need to be taught, and can we teach them in an easily remembered manner? It was suggested that we adopt the approach of Atul Gawande. So Atul Gawande's approach is to require simple checklists to be performed and marked as performed by hospital workers. Um, this, this approach has led to significant drops in hospital accidents and hospital-acquired infections, even among people that are very experienced surgeons, nurses um, in, in hospitals, when they adopted these practices, uh, it greatly reduced problems. And some of his checklist ideas have been adopted in other um, industries. For example, in air, air traffic controllers now use Gawande checklists. So our committee adopted a four-point Gawande checklist to address the patient's psychological needs. And we developed these four points based on what patients told us in their interviews and based on what the uh, psych trauma consultants knew about psychological trauma and what the opposite of psychological trauma can be. So um, when, pa when we thought of what causes psychological trauma, patients being alone, out of control, not knowing what's happening next, and not being able to think or act, so we picked, you know, we were thinking about all that together, and then we thought, what are the, what are four things in the kind of Gawande checklist uh, way of doing things? What are four things that we could, we could simply put into the curriculum? And we came up with these: patients should be offered social support, patients should be given choice and control, patients should be helped to anticipate what would be happening next and patients should be encouraged to re-engage their cognitive skills, helping them identify their immediate concerns and plan how to respond to those concerns. 
So here are some examples. So in social support, something like, I am EMT Car Carol, and I am here to help you. You are safe, and I'm going to take very good care of you. Or, I know you're scared about your mother, but my partner is looking after her. Here's some for choice and control. Give control when possible. Would you like the blood pressure cuff on your right or left arm? Or would you like a blanket? And anticipate. Help the patient anticipate what's going to happen next so they're not frightened and confused. We will be at the hospital in about 10 minutes as an example. Or we're going to lift you onto the stretcher now. And then for plan and organize, we thought of things like help the patient think and plan. Is there, like, is there anything you would like to bring to the hospital? Or is there anyone you would like me to call for you? Then the checklist was organized by paramedic Dave Brenner as a mnemonic, escape psychological trauma. And the E's on either end are like kind of silent E's in that we don't, they are just to make the mnemonic. And um, the other four represent uh, the four-point scale. S for social engagement, C for choice and control, A for anticipate, and P for plan and organize. Then the team developed materials. A PowerPoint presentation which explains the, psychological, the nature of psychological trauma and the escape protocol. And Dave Brenner and William Schaub, experienced EMS, and, uh, EMS workers and educators, modified the skill sheets that reflect whether the student used the four skills in the process of learning and demonstrating the specific medical skills. So these skills were integrated into the physical skills that the EMS students were normally um, taught. We, um, as a team, also created role play scripts in which effective and ineffective psychological interventions are demonstrated. And then um, student evaluation forms were uh, created that asked students to reflect on their experience of the program. And an agenda and materials for the train the trainer workshop. Uh, we then engaged Carl Auerbach, a research psychologist, and he worked with us to develop quantitative and qualitative evaluations. To date, the protocol has been taught to three EMT classes and one paramedic class. All students filled out a five-point evaluation form, and nine students were interviewed individually and asked about their reaction to the escape protocol. So we got a, a great deal of information from these extensive evaluations and from uh, these 45 minutes to an hour interviews that we did with each of the nine students. And the evaluation results were as follows. The students felt they'd learned a valuable set of skills that could help them prevent psychological trauma in their patients. The students did not feel that learning the escape skills interfered, interfered with their learning their physical skills. The students saw themselves as more able to manage their own emotions. They were, were, recognized their compassion and believed that other people saw them this way as well. The students felt their escape training increased their employment opportunities. The students felt the faculty did a very good job of teaching the escape skills. The students felt proud of their escape training. The students felt more empowered and confident in their ability to perform their EMT tasks. And this was reflected uh, by their rotation evaluation. For example, one student said that because she was practicing the skills, she calmed down herself because she was more related to the patient. And that made it much easier for her to perform the physical skills. The escape students felt safer dealing with patients in emergencies. They knew what to say and what to do when patients and their families were emotionally upset or asking questions. We also gave faculty evaluations. Um, we gave the faculty evaluations to fill out. And they uh, gave us the following. They found that the curriculum was easy to teach, and they did not feel that it interfered with teaching the physical skills at all. Dave Brenner and Megan Williams, very experienced um, paramedics, 
who practiced the escape skills in their own clinical work reported that the ambulance team was more cooperative and more relaxed than other teams they have worked with. And again, remember, and it's, it's similar to what Atul Gawande felt with experienced surgeons, nurses, and uh, other professionals in the hospital, uh, even though both Dave Brenner and Megan Williams are experienced and very related when they deal with patients, that the escape skills, just remembering these four skills actually really helped everybody in the ambulance. And they reported that the ambulance runs on their ambulance runs, uh, patients expressed more gratitude than they had in the past. We appreciate all of you listening to our webinar uh, on the overview of the project's development. More details and supporting materials will be presented at the October 1st Northeast Resilience, Resiliency Consortium meeting in Hartford, Connecticut. We want to let you know that Faculty and students have enthusiastically embraced this training, and we believe it has the potential to be a national model, not only for EMS workers, but also for other first responders and healthcare providers. Our personal thanks to President Gail Nello of LaGuardia Community College for her support of this project, and the other members of our team, LaGuardia EMS faculty David Brenner, William Schaub, and Megan Williams. Please spread the word to your minions. Psychological trauma prevention should be added to all EMS programs. And thank you to all of the EMTs and paramedics in our country and throughout the world who work helping others each day. Stay safe and be well. If anyone has any questions, we are here for you. Thank you, Christine, uh, for that a really incredible presentation. At this time, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and open up the floor for any questions. Um, we are at 11.30, and that is um, past the scheduled webinar time. Um, and again, we do apologize for the technical difficulties that we had at the beginning um, and the late start for today's webinar. Um, again, I'll just go over the two options that you all have for submitting questions. Um, Again, you can raise your hand, um, and what I'll do is if you raise your hand and have a question, I'll go ahead and unmute your line, and you'll be able to ask your question directly. Um, or if you would like, you can also submit your question through um, the question pane, and what I'll do is I'll go ahead and read the question out loud for um, everyone to hear and to allow um, Christine, um, Shelley, and Rosemary to, to go ahead and respond to your questions. Okay, so I have, um, first question is from Anna Ketch. So Anna, what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to go ahead and unmute your line right now um, and allow you to ask the question. Hi, uh, this is Anna at Capital Community College. Um, my question is actually, I was wondering what, what um, we had a faculty member that couldn't be here today on the webinar, but I'm wondering what, what more details or supporting materials are going to be at the conference and on which date and time, so maybe he could stop by. The presentation will be Thursday, October 1st, mm -hmm. from 3 to 4.30 p.m., mm -hmm. and we will be uh, giving the uh, skill sheets uh, that we use in our program, so uh, those certainly can be adapted to a different state's um, use, but the samples of what we use here in New York uh, are going to be distributed. Um, we can also uh, give um, copies of our PowerPoint, uh, which we use in our class, for the students. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. And thank you for your question. Okay, we have a, another question from Paul. Um, Paul, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your line at this time.
Well, so I'm showing on here um, that I need you to enter your audio pin. Um, your audio pin can be found under the audio pane on the right-hand side of the screen. Paul, I'm still having trouble um, getting you online. If you would like to submit your question or comment, I would be more than happy to read it out loud. Or if you'd like to submit the audio pin um, provided, you can find it under the dial and access code information on the audio window pane. Um, in the meantime, I would be more than happy. Um, <laughs> I would be more than happy to take any more calls or any more questions um, from the audience. And I actually just received. Uh, Paul's message, and he just wanted to say thank you very much uh, for today's presentation and for, for sharing um, this information, not only with the Northeast Resiliency Consortium, but with um, all of the attendees on today's webinar. You're welcome. Uh, so. I am not showing any more questions. So at this time, if there are any final questions or comments that anyone would like to share, I'm going to go ahead and leave the window pane open for um, a few more minutes um, to take any, any other questions that you all may have. Okay, so I'm not, um, sorry for the feedback, I'm not showing any more um, questions or comments. Um, we would like to say uh, on behalf of Achieving the Dream, thank you again to um, our presenters on today's webinar. We will be following up with um, an email later this week that will contain or the recording for today's webinar as well as the PowerPoint slides that were presented on today's presentation. Um, as Christine said, we will be having a follow-up session at the Northeast Resiliency Consortium meeting that will be occurring from October 1st to October 3rd in Hartford, Connecticut. I am sure you all have uh, received messages from Meredith uh, regarding registration for the webinar. Um, and I'll pass this over to um, Christine, Shelley, and Rosemary for any last um, words before we log off for today's presentation. Thank you all for listening. Look forward to seeing you at the consortium meeting. And if not, uh, please pass along the webinar to whoever might be interested. Thank you. Okay, Great. Thank you all um, for your time uh, to today's webinar. We look forward to following up and seeing you in Hartford in a week. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.